Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. As part of the Guest Speaker Cochrane Learning Live webinar series, today's webinar session is about rapid reviews to strengthen uh, health policy and systems. So before we start, let me just remind you that if you would like to ask any question, um, at first, everyone will be muted except the presenter. So there is the option of raising your hand, which is on the left of your uh, uh, tab of the GoToWebinar tab. So please click on it and it will show uh, on our screens that you have a question and we will uh, make sure that you get to the chance to ask your question in the questions and answers section. And also, if you'd like to send us directly your question, please use the questions panel that is also on the right under, um, so under attendees, under audio, then there's a section called questions. Please feel free to send a question there. So today's session is about rapid reviews, strengthening health policy systems. Uh, we will start with Dr. Etienne Longlois from the Alliance for Health Policy and Systems Research, World Health Organization in Geneva, Switzerland. So just uh, to tell you about the session plan, Dr. Etienne will introduce us to rapid reviews. Then we'll have Dr. Andrea Trico to tell us about engaging knowledge users in rapid reviews and rapid review methods. Then we'll have Professor John Davis to tell, uh, as a guest network member to tell us about their perspective and their experience and we'll open 20 minutes for discussion and questions. To introduce Dr. Etienne, uh, Dr. Etienne is an epidemiologist specialized in health systems research, maternal and neonatal healthcare services and knowledge synthesis. He's trained in medicine, global public health and epidemiology. He manages for the WHO Alliance HSP, HPSR, various portfolios of work on primary healthcare systems, health systems research synthesis, implementation research and embedded research, placing evidence to policy at the center of its activities. Dr. Langlois research focuses on skilled birth attendance and postnatal care services in low and middle income countries, as well as methods to advance embedded research and health systems research synthesis. His previous positions include researcher and lecturer in clinical epidemiology and global health at the Faculty of Medicine, University of Montreal, Canada. He lived in Burkina Faso and worked in numerous low middle income countries, an experience which led him to be a strong advocate of evidence informed interventions to support health equity and universal health coverage. Great, thank you very much, uh, Tamara, for this fine introduction and welcome everyone to this webinar on rapid reviews to strengthen health policy and systems. To um, echo Tamara's uh, uh, introduction, uh, here are the objectives of the webinar. I'll be uh, discussing the usefulness of rapid reviews and their application to health policy and system decisions. Um, and Patricia will then speak about some of the methods uh, as well as engagement of knowledge users in the process. And uh, John Levis will then compare some of the similarities and differences across the uh, EVIPnet affiliated rapid evidence services. And that will be followed by a Q&A period. Um, so to give you a, a bit of uh, context, um, so globally what we're witnessing is an increasing demand for relevant and context sensitive evidence to strengthen health policy and systems. Uh, countries worldwide are developing universal health coverage schemes um, and they need timely health system evidence uh, pertaining to um, service delivery, health financing, health governance, and so on and so forth. Uh, so policymakers and health systems managers require reviews that address a range of issues from the effectiveness of health systems interventions and policies to um, how and in what settings these interventions work. So uh, reviews of implementation science, um, as well as reviews of cost effectiveness. But what we've come to realize uh, at the Alliance and at WHO in working to promote the uh, use of review findings in policy and practice is, is that there remains important barriers to this process, to both the conduct and the use of systematic reviews. And we've outlined here three of the main barriers uh, that, that we report. So timeliness or the fact that too often review cycles and uh, policy and practice cycles are misaligned. Um, and the second one being relevance or the lack of policy relevance of systematic reviews and different forms of evidence synthesis. And the third one is, um, is a question of efficiency. Um, so rapid reviews then have emerged as a, uh, as a useful approach to provide uh, actionable and relevant evidence in a timely and 
cost effective manner. Uh, very often they, uh, they stem uh, from requests by knowledge users uh, themselves. So that demand-driven feature really contributes to uh, the applicability, the usability of review findings to inform policy and system decision. Um, another key characteristic of RAP reviews is uh, their context sensitivity. Uh, so they are helpful in producing context-sensitive knowledge uh, uh, necessary to inform local uh, decisions uh, on health system questions. Um, they're extremely useful, obviously, in emergency response to inform guidelines and Muted. Uh, guidance in a timely fashion, but um, they're also very uh, useful in routine decision making around uh, the health system determinants and health policy making. So, obviously, RAP reviews are, are critical in the movement towards uh, evidence-informed decision-making, and I would argue that uh, this is, uh, especially when the counterfactual is not using evidence to inform policy and system decisions. Um, to give you a bit of background on the rationale for producing the practical guide, which is the basis for today's uh, webinar, um, the book was conceived uh, following uh, an ident identification of lack of guidance on when and how to conduct rapid reviews within the context of health policy making and health system strengthening. Um, and at the Alliance, we support different systematic review centers in low and middle income countries. And in engaging with those centers, we've really identified this need for guidance, the need to collate some of the good practices and the conduct and the use of uh, rapid reviews, but also the need for open access material and tools to strengthen the capacity um, for RAP reviews in low and middle income countries, um, so uh, to be used as a teaching and training tool. Um, we've, uh, we've outlined here the uh, conception of rapid review for the purpose of this guide, and so we uh, understand rapid re reviews as a, a type of knowledge synthesis in which systematic review processes are accelerated and methods are streamlined to complete the review more quickly than is the case for typical systematic reviews. So what we're looking at here is really a knowledge generation strategy and not a knowledge translation strategy, for instance. Um, and so uh, it, our understanding of RAP reviews, for the, again, for the purpose of this guide, is, um, is a synthesis of findings and assessment of validity of research evidence using abbreviated systematic review methods. So in that case, uh, they're different, for instance, from rapid policy brief, and we'll have a chance to come back to that in uh, John Levis's uh, presentation. Um, this is here the cover of the uh, practical guide. It was developed by uh, three co-editors, Andrea Trico, Sharon Strauss, and myself, with a tremendous input by a lot of authors that you see here on the screen, um, uh, and many reviewers, as well as uh, folks involved in managing the production of this book. So really a tremendous collective effort. Um, here is the content of the guide. Uh, it, it introduces its application for policy and system decisions, obviously showcases some of the methods and approaches to streamline the review process, but it also provides hands-on guidance and practical examples of rapid reviews in the field of health policy and systems research. Uh, we've also identified some of the challenges and a research agenda for the field, and I'll have a chance to come back to that. So I mentioned um, practical examples. One of the examples that is in the, in the book is around a rapid review on health systems evidence uh, to, uh, to inform the situation in Syria. Um, so what we witness in, uh, in Syria is obviously a breakdown in critical infrastructure, including water and sanitation system, uh, massive scale of population displacement, a loss of human resources for health, um, infrastructure, equipment, medicine, uh, et, et cetera. So uh, reduced health system functionality across the board that led to rapid spread of communicable diseases. Uh, we've witnessed in the country a resurgence of polio, uh, whereby the uh, disease has, has actually been eradicated. So, um, so, so tremendous needs in terms of understanding the situation. And in light of this, the Syria Public Health Network identified a need for up-to-date and context-sensitive evidence on communicable diseases prevention and control measures in war-torn Syria, and they uh, conducted a rapid review to describe the trends in major communicable diseases, as well as document the challenges to outbreak and infectious disease management. Um, 
it was the RAV review was conducted in seven weeks and they applied three main strategies. The first one was to use a clearly defined conceptual framework. The second one was to limit the time period for the literature searches. And the third one was to employ a large review team with varied skill sets. Um, so here is uh, uh, some information on the key features of rapid reviews. Uh, rapid reviews are generated through a transparent, scientific, and reproducible method that respects the key principles of knowledge synthesis. I've alluded to some of the methods in the Syria uh, practical example, but there are various approaches to enhance the timeliness of reviews. Um, for instance, knowledge synthesis shortcuts, automation or the use of uh, machine learning technology, um, as well as intensification of review steps or working in parallel to accelerate the review process. Um, one important message that we put forth in the book is that it's critical for authors to document and report the method to uphold the transparency of uh, the process. Um, we have included here some information about the time frame. So empirical evidence uh, tells us that on average, a rapid review is conducted over a five to 12 week period um, uh, as compared to a standard systematic review that on average takes one to two years. Um, here is a second uh, practical example um, around the issue of medical malpractice policies in obstetrics. It was uh, commissioned by the WHO, um, and it's a rapid scoping review. And this infographic is to show uh, one strategy, which is, uh, again, the intensification of uh, some of the review processes. So if we look at the, the two of the review stages, um, screening and data abstraction, the two first ones, uh, the team has employed nine reviewers to intensify the process and, uh, and, um, and accelerate the, uh, the review production. This here is an outline of the guide's chapters. Uh, we're not gonna go in detail about the, the content, but um, the message uh, we'd like to convey is that we're going in this book beyond uh, some of the methods to, uh, to streamline the review process, and we're addressing issues around promoting the use uh, of rapid reviews in policy and practice. Um, uh, there's a chapter on reporting and disseminating rapid reviews, and there's another chapter on strategies to strengthen capacities for the conduct and the use of reviews in LMICs. Um, finally, uh, I mentioned in the introduction that we've identified some of the challenges and research uh, needs, uh, and I'd like to mention that uh, I've just presented uh, the what the guide is, but um, it's important to note what the guide is not, and that is a one-size-fits-all approach to rapid reviews of health system evidence. So we are cognizant that there's no magic bullet uh, in the field, but there are various approaches to, to streamline the process. So two of the challenges that we've identified uh, are around the complexity of health systems evidence. So there's a dichotomy between fast-tracking the review process and trying to unpack and understand the complexity of this, uh, this type of evidence. And then the second challenge is around the conduct and application of RAP reviews in LMICs. Um, in terms of the research agenda, um, two uh, priority research agenda uh, uh, items um, on the screen. The first one is uh, potential risk of biases that might be introduced by rapid review methods, and there is ongoing research in this regard. Um, and the second one is around the external valid validity as applied to rapid reviews of context-sensitive um, uh, data. Uh, but that is also a challenge, I would argue, for the broader field of health systems research synthesis. Um, so the guide is available online. Uh, it's open access. Uh, and here is the link to download the PDF version. And I understand that we'll also be sharing this information with you in due course. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Etienne. Um, so now we will move to Dr. Andrea Trico. And uh, let me introduce Andrea. And uh, so Dr. Andrea will be talking about engaging knowledge users in rapid reviews and rapid review methods. Dr. Trico is from the Lee K. Chang Knowledge Institute of St. Michael Hospital in Toronto, Canada. She holds a Tier 2 Canada Research Chair in Knowledge Synthesis. Her research interests are related to responding to knowledge users, including patients, healthcare providers, and policymakers through knowledge synthesis. The research also focuses on advancing the science of knowledge synthesis, and she is leading research projects related to rapid reviews, network meta-analyses, and scoping reviews. 
Andrea? Yes, um, so I wasn't sure if we were going to do the two polls now tomorrow. Yes, we can definitely do that. Perfect. So, so everyone, we are going to share a poll right now. Um, you should be seeing the poll right now and you can click on the answer um, or more than one answer. So the question is, in which step, in which steps of a rapid review have you or your team engaged knowledge users? Please select all that apply to uh, your case. Okay, still have people voting. All right, so for the first poll, the answers are, um, so a big percentage has used all four of the uh, options, which are conceptualization, ah, conceptualization and design, literature search and study selection, data collection and synthesis, and knowledge product development. Great, so we will keep these results for later. And our next question is, what methods have you or your team used to streamline the review process? Please select all that apply. And the options are limit search by date and or language, limit the number of databases searched, use one reviewer to perform study selection, narratively synthesize results. Okay, great. And so the results for this question are, almost everyone has used all four, but mostly limit search by date and or language. Great. Thank you, everyone. Andrea? Yes. Great. So I will now uh, share my screen. So thank you so much, everyone, for um sending in those answers so that will definitely be used to inform part of my presentation today um can you currently see my screen tomorrow yes perfect okay so let me pull this up there we go great Excellent. So I um, personally have no conflicts of interest related to this presentation. However, my research institute did receive funding from the WHO to help uh, facilitate creation of the practical guide. So I'm going to discuss some different rapid review methods as well as how to engage knowledge users in rapid reviews. And this is both these uh, two topics are part of the guide. So I'm presenting two different chapters that are part of the guide that um, ATN had provided the link for. So the evidence-based supporting streamlined methods is limited and evolving. Um, and as ATN notes, uh, to try to further the research agenda, we actually need more evidence to figure out which are the most robust approaches. So we've recently conducted a systematic review looking at all of the limitations um, when for screening during the systematic review for data abstraction and quality appraisal. Um, so this systematic review was registered with Prospero. It's a methodological review and we're specifically looking at the evidence base for methodological shortcuts. And preliminary findings of our review are recorded in the guide. Um, I believe it's in chapter three. So this will be submitted for publication in the Journal of Clinical Epidemiology in the next month or so. But basically, when we look at the evidence base, we see that we don't find much evidence on the implications of 
um, searching more than one database for published studies, or using date and language search limitations. So there is some empirical evidence um, if you to suggest that you need to search more than uh, one database, for example. However, and we do have some empirical evidence on limiting to published studies, um, as well as some language search limitations, but we haven't found, you know, on average, uh, what the, the estimate of bias would be for this particular shortcut. Um, when it comes to study selection, so when we talk about should we have one reviewer and perhaps uh, with or without verification, we see that if we have one person screening the titles and abstracts, we miss an average of about 8 to 20 percent of eligible studies. However, it does reduce the time uh, quite a bit when, versus having two people screening the literature search results. And when we think about data abstraction, so if we have one person abstracting with or without verification, we do see that there are more errors. Um, however, time is being saved. And when we've looked at meta-analysis, the empirical evidence suggests that these changes actually didn't significantly affect the overall uh, meta-analysis results. Um, for quality assessment, if we have one reviewer assess with or without verification, again, we don't have as much evidence on this. Um, so just showing that um, there, there are some gaps that potentially can be filled. In terms of some steps that we would recommend, um, so when you're doing a rapid review and you want to do things a bit faster, but you want to kind of balance this whole risk of bias versus timeliness of results, we recommend including content experts as well as experienced reviewers. So if you have people who know the area really, really well, and if you have people who know how to do reviews and, and have been doing them for a few years, it actually will help enhance the rigor and it will also help make the review process a lot faster. So you can imagine if you're a content expert and you know the field quite well, you would be able to screen faster and perhaps screen with a little bit more higher validity or reliability if you know the field quite well uh, versus someone who's, who's a junior in the, in the area or new to the field and has to look up a lot of information. So for the rapid review teams, so if we have content experts in health policy and systems research, as well as experienced reviewers who are, are experienced in study selection, data abstraction, and quality appraisal, we're hoping that this will actually make a faster and potentially more rigorous process. Um, another great thing about including content experts on your team is that they can answer questions along the way. And it's great to find people who are quite responsive. So we do a lot of clinical reviews, so we, and we work with a lot of clinicians, and we have an ongoing list of clinicians that we know are quite responsive. So those are the people that we want to collaborate with on our, our systematic reviews or our, our rapid reviews, because they answer us quickly and we're able to kind of keep going with the process quite fast. As well, if we have well-defined eligibility criteria, if we use explanation and elaboration forms, as well as pilot testing, the uh, screening forms and data abstraction forms. Um, so just, I'm not sure if everyone is familiar with pilot testing, but uh, basically it's a calibration exercise. So what we would do is we would devise our inclusion and exclusion criteria, or study eligibility criteria, and then we would choose a random sample of 25 citations for the level one screening of titles and abstracts. And what we would do is we would have the entire team actually test out the eligibility form on these 25 uh, random, a random sample of 25 citations. So let's say we have 10 people on the team, all 10 people would go ahead and they would uh, screen the 25 citations and then we would calculate a percent agreement. And we usually don't proceed unless we have a greater than 75% agreement. Another thing that we do is we tend to see how people did on the, the screening uh, in the pilot test. 
and we tend to match up the weaker screeners with the stronger screeners. So people who scored perfectly and had perfect agreement with the correct answers, we would assign them uh, to screen in duplicate with the person who perhaps had a lower agreement on average than the others, for example. So that um, makes sure that we're able to uh, um, screen things more efficiently in a sense. Um, there may be more conflicts the way that we set it up, but hopefully nothing is missed to increase the reliability. So if we use well-defined eligibility criteria, explanation and elaboration forms, we pilot test, we do review training, and this should hopefully support reviewers in study selection, data extraction, as well as quality assessment. So this is a nice visual of some of the things that we can do to improve quality and efficiency. So again, let's make sure that we use uh, very clear eligibility criteria. What we do with my, with my team is that we would have a senior research coordinator would help establish the eligibility criteria. And then this would be reviewed by the support research coordinator on the team. And then this would be reviewed by myself, um, who would be the review methodologist. And it would also be reviewed by the content expert. And this way we have all of the information ready to go for our calibration test. And then we usually do some tweaking during the calibration test to make sure that the eligibility criteria are very clear. Um, in our uh, elaboration and, and um, uh, elaboration forms, we have a lot of examples. We have a bunch of definitions. So we clearly outline, we want you to focus on randomized trials, for example. The definition of a randomized trial is this, as an example. Uh, we want you to include children. And to be conservative, let's include any study where the children are age 21 years or less, for example. So we, we provide definitions on every single item uh, to make it very clear to people when they're screening. So another thing that we can do is to consult authors of the studies. And again, sometimes it does take time for authors to get back to you. In general, we've been tracking this for a couple of years. We usually get about 65% response from authors, but it doesn't necessarily mean we get the answer that we want. So many times, even though 65% of them will respond, they may not necessarily give us the data. Um, they may say that the study was too old, or they may say that um, they don't have the time to give us the necessary details that we're looking for. So if you do have a bit of time and you're not sure about a particular study, one thing to consider is potentially contacting authors. And if you do get success, if you are successful and they respond quickly, then, then you're quite fortunate and you can potentially use this to, to inform your rapid review. One thing to note is that we usually give a time cutoff. So we usually say that we will contact authors this month and we'll allow them four weeks to respond. If it's a rapid review and you only have five weeks to do the rapid review, then this might be something that you would potentially not be able to do. However, if you have a longer timeline for a rapid review, like 12 weeks, then potentially you can say, let's contact these 10 authors and give them one or two weeks to respond. And if we don't hear back from them, we will proceed. So this is just a nice visual again, just to highlight how um, we can contact them. So some of the information that we ask about is related to whether the study actually is eligible. So thinking about the different components of your eligibility criteria and asking for clarification on that. Sometimes we want the data to be reported in a different way. So uh, we know that it's a relevant study, but it's not reported in a way that we can abstract the data. So it would be asking for data clarifications. I have to say that those would probably be the two most common reasons that uh, we contact authors. However, there are other reasons that you may contact them. For example, I know some review centers contact authors to ask about risk of bias. So asking whether allocation concealment, uh, as an example, was, was performed. 
Um, so now I'm going to move on to engaging knowledge users. So before I begin, I just wanted to provide a definition of a knowledge user. And for um, anyone who listened to my webinars in the summer, I believe I provided the same definition. So this is put forth by the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, who defines a knowledge user as an individual who is likely to be able to use research results to make informed decisions, and whether that is about uh, health policy programs or other types of practices. So one of the things that we recommend in the guide um, in our chapter on engaging knowledge users is to um, make sure that they're engaged throughout the conduct of the rapid review. And there is some preliminary evidence suggesting that this will enhance the relevance and applicability of the reviews in the decision-making process. And so I do want to note that our chapter on engaging knowledge users in the guide is based on a scoping review that was commissioned uh, by the WHO on how to engage knowledge users and particular policymakers and, and health system managers in knowledge synthesis. So we uh, had um, registered our scoping review with the Open Science Framework and we published a scoping review protocol and we recently submitted our paper to Implementation Science um, and it's currently undergoing peer review. So this will be something that will hopefully be published within the next year. Sometimes the publication process takes longer than we would like. Um, but uh, for the, the guide, we actually tried to focus this a bit more on rapid reviews and how we could potentially engage knowledge users. So we, again, note a balance here. So just like with the methods, there's a balance between rigor and timeliness and being responsive. So the same thing we see here. So there is a balance with trying to engage knowledge users at every single step. Um, however, this does actually require additional time and resources. So it's additional staff time. It's our time discussing with the knowledge users who are usually very busy. It's trying to find time in their schedule. Um, however, we do. There is some evidence to suggest that it will make the review findings a lot more relevant and applicable. So in terms of the level of engagement, it should be meaningful. So there is some uh, evidence that to suggest that a barrier to engagement is this tokenistic engagement. So where policymakers may feel that it's not really true meaningful engagement and it was more tokenistic to be able to check that box off to say that, yes, we engaged knowledge users in our review. So really, it should be meaningful. It should be an open, collaborative relationship between the researchers and the knowledge users. It should be tailored to the available resources. So if your rapid review needs to be done in a week or two weeks or three weeks, you know, maybe you don't have the time to do a lot of engagement. Um, to note that some of our rapid reviews, so the one that ATM pres presented on the medical malpractice uh, case study. So that was a rapid review that was commissioned by the WHO and we had six weeks to conduct that rapid review um, and that one actually was recently published uh, in the Systematic Reviews Journal. So I'm happy to share the citation for that. Uh, but just wanted to note that it actually took us three months to work with the WHO to actually come up with the research question. So and then the clock started ticking once everything had kind of been um, once everything had been agreed upon. So basically, we, we agreed upon the research question, took us two to three months to do that, and then the, time, the clock started ticking. We had six weeks to conduct the research and submit them the, the preliminary report. So, so that's where, you know, sometimes you have to negotiate with your knowledge user when the timelines will start and when they will stop. Um, and, you know, we had the luxury of being able to work closely with the knowledge user to figure out exactly what was required. And, and I, I'm sure people who have experience with rapid reviews know how much negotiation that that could take. Um, taking a research question or a question from a policymaker and trying to translate it into a research project. 
So again, we want to make sure that we tailor our approach to resources, and um, this will depend on what are our objectives of engagement. So what do we what do we need from this engagement? When do we think the best time within the review process would be to to make sure that engagement occurs? And what are the different types of methods that we can use to engage? Great, so this will show us that we can do a one-time consultation, more than one consultation at every step. Again, it's, it's very nice when we have the luxury of being able to have a consultation at every single step, but oftentimes, especially when we're doing a rapid review, this may not necessarily really be, um, we might not be able to actually do this. So there is numerous objectives, so perhaps we want to establish a research agenda or prioritize indicators, perhaps we want to work with our knowledge users to come with a framework, uh, establish learning materials, perhaps we're thinking about clinical policy or system recommendations, it might be a toolkit for supporting evidence use, we may be interested in finalizing our knowledge translation and uptake strategies, and perhaps we uh, would like to help decision makers with their decision making processes. So there's many different objectives or reasons why we would engage with knowledge users. So it's good to, to clarify this from the outset just so that everyone knows uh, what the reason is why this is happening and uh, to be able to make sure that you will reach these goals. So there's also numerous points of engagement. So we can prioritize a list of topics to, to so we can actually come up with a list, perhaps based on the, the systematic review or rapid review findings, and then we can work with them to review or prioritize the list, for example, or perhaps they can be involved with the developing the question, developing the protocol, perhaps they're involved with refining and supplementing the search, or providing information on the data collection tools. They may be providing us input into the analysis, um, interpreting and contextualizing findings, uh, as well as providing feedback and clarity and readability of the report. Um, so there's many different points where you would be engaging. And again, this would relate to what the purpose of engagement is and where would it make the most uh, sense. We can also gather feedback on the usability of the review. And this is kind of a nice feedback loop because um, there is some reviews out there where, where they actually started with the review and then they moved on and, and worked with the knowledge user to do some further work based on that. So coming up with a framework or coming up with a curriculum and other types of examples depending on the, the purpose of engagement. So in terms of how can we go about doing this, we're becoming a more global research community. So a lot of time the communication will actually be done through webinars. Um, they could be done over the phone, um, uh, through email. We could do document sharing and feedback. Um, lesser so, we're doing less in-person meetings. It depends on where your knowledge user is, if they're local, and you're able to, to, to make that happen. That's always best. If you can, if you have the resources and time, but often what we do is we're usually doing these through telephone and through the internet. Um, also wanted to note that there are conceptual frameworks that can help provide a structure and mechanism to help facilitate engagement. So in the guide, we mentioned these two frameworks and uh, one of them focuses on comparative effectiveness research and another one is looking at policymakers and health policy and systems research. So these are just examples. There are many other frameworks for engagement, but we wanted to kind of present uh, different examples uh, coming from the different perspectives. So depending on the framework that you're using, for example, the one that was put forth by Sandy Oliver and Dixon, um, they, they talk about increasing policymaker awareness and skills, obtaining stable funding. So if we have a stable funding source, then you're able to have these ongoing relationships and perhaps, perhaps uh, will help facilitate engagement. So just um, wrapping up here, a few other things to consider would be establishing your partnerships early, planning ahead, 
communicating expectations and responsibilities, ongoing training and support, support, accessibility and documentation of all interactions. So we want to make sure that we engage with our knowledge users right at the beginning is best. Um, we want to make sure that we send them documents to review at least one or two weeks ahead of time. We want to make sure everyone is clear on what their responsibilities and roles are and provide them with support throughout the whole process. So now I think we will pass this on to Dr. John Levis. Thank you, Andrea. <clears throat> so to introduce Professor John, Professor John holds the Canada Research Chair in Evidence Informed Health Systems. He is the director of the McMaster Health Forum and Forum Plus, co-director of WHO Collaborating Center for Evidence Informed Policy, associate director for the Michael G. DeGroote Parker in Canada Center and professor in the Department of Health Evidence and Impact at McMaster University. He is co-chair of the WHO-sponsored Evidence Informed Policy Network and Net Global Steering Group. John? So confluence of interest, non-financial, professional, I, I have collaborations with many of the chapter contributors and I'm involved in VIPNet and the forum uh, and I'm going to be talking about those briefly. Um, I, I really like the guide. I think it's a really important contribution and I want to highlight four key strengths. So one is how it covers the full life cycle of a review and gives very clear insight about where uh, expediting can happen. I think that's hugely helpful. Uh, second, uh, our experience is that the involvement of policymakers and managers, certainly at the question posing stage, but at different stages of the process as well, is key, and, and the guide actively supports that active involvement. Um, the third thing that I think is very critical um, is that it specifically looks at the challenges associated with reviewing health policy and systems research, which I think is distinct uh, in many important ways from other types of research and also doing it in low middle income countries. So both of those pieces, I think, uh, again, increase the value of the guide. Uh, and the final thing, which I think is very important, is that it acknowledges that many types of questions can be asked, and hence many types of reviews are needed, uh, not just questions about what works. And that means that uh, the guide is not just about reviews of effects. Uh, a very minor quibble, there's sometimes where language like risk of bias is used, uh, which to me doesn't embrace the full suite of more qualitative uh, synthesis methodology. I don't think that language would typically be used for some of those approaches, but generally uh, the guide is superb at recognizing that policymakers have many questions about problem options and implementation considerations. The, my main uh, additional point uh, is that we need many types of rapid evidence products, and I think the, the guide's contributors would agree with me. Uh, on page six, um, they in fact uh, uh, identify two other types of rapid evidence products. I'm going to uh, speak to what they call rapid response briefs. Um, there's language there that they don't generate new knowledge. I kind of understand why they say that, um, and it's not the focus of the guide, so this isn't a critique of them. Uh, I think we need, would need a separate guide on those types of products. Uh, they focus on what they call rapid reviews. Um, so uh, I think that's a hugely important contribution, but what I just want to talk about briefly is a complementary approach which I think can exist alongside uh, what they're describing. Um, so when I talk about rapid response briefs, they give two examples uh, in the guide. One that I'll call rapid synthesis. I wouldn't get hung up on the words. What matters is what I mean. Summary, the best evidence on any question lightly contextualized to the health system and the political system and on rapid timelines, for example, 310 or 30 business days. Uh, the, the guides contributors also describe uh, what I would call an evidence brief for policy. This works through what's known about a problem, three options, key implementation considerations. It's heavily contextualized. It's increasingly, uh, for many platforms, complemented by a citizen brief. Um, it's used as an input to a citizen panel or one or more in the case of a brief or a stakeholder dialogue in the case of an evidence brief. So with this approach, you get the best evidence, you get citizen values, 
and you get stakeholder insights, still on reasonable timelines, still on the timelines um, that were in keeping with the types of rapid reviews that Andrea was talking about. So for example, seven weeks for a brief and a stakeholder dialogue, 10 weeks if you were at uh, to add in one to three citizen panels. Uh, so those are two different types of complementary uh, rapid products. I'm going to focus on the rapid syntheses. And what I did was I contacted uh, a number of uh, people who work within kind of the AVIPNET framework just to ask them a set of questions about what they do and what lessons they've learned over time. Uh, you'll see three are from the African region of WHO, two are from the Americas, and one is from the Eastern Mediterranean region. And the names of the contact people are at the end of my slides if you want to follow up with any of them. In terms of volume, uh, you'll see uh, a VIPNET Chile producing one roughly every three or four weeks, every year for four years. Knowledge to Policy Center in Lebanon, constrained by funding, only able to produce two per year. Uh, turnaround time, uh, I think one of the key messages providing structured options. Here's what you can expect in five days versus 20 days, uh, but I'll just point out the need to be flexible. You'll see with Reach Policy Uganda, they've sometimes uh, pulled the best evidence they can in a 24-hour period. Um, you'll see in the next row for topic areas, most of these groups are health system experts and they focus exclusively on that, but some also deal with public health. None of them focus on clinical issues. So these are groups that have specialized uh, in health systems and then can provide the value add that comes with that content expertise. You'll see all of them address any question that comes in with the exception of a VIPNET Chile, which only addresses questions of effects. In terms of the types of evidence examined, as opposed to what Andrea was describing, where the unit was studies, pulling in studies and synthesizing what's learned, these groups are drawing on existing systematic reviews. Some of them also look at frameworks, some of them also look at economic evaluations. If I go on to the next slide, uh, you'll see that they also sometimes include complementary information to add additional value. So uh, many of them provide local data and key points from locally available reports. Uh, in the case of the McMaster Health Forum, although I'm not a fan of them, uh, politicians love jurisdictional scans. They want to know uh, what are Chile, Argentina, and Peru doing? What is the United Kingdom, Australia, and New Zealand doing? Uh, but the nice thing about putting that in a, a rapid synthesis is you can say, here's what they're doing, but we have no evidence on whether they're actually achieving outcomes at reasonable cost. You'll see in the next row a spectrum of decision-maker involvement, of IPNET Chile perhaps the most structured. Uh, you'll see in the next row after that that there's often peer or merit review. So very often these are being reviewed by policymakers and stakeholders as well as uh, researchers. Uh, some of them, like the one at the forum, provide the rapid review and uh, in the case of a 10-day and then five days later send the revised version based on the external review. Some of them, in fact, then turn into full evidence briefs and a dialogue. Others, in the case of the Knowledge to Policy Centers, involve ongoing interaction with the policymakers to address points of clarification. And in my last slide, uh, you'll see that one of the key things in working with policymakers is sometimes you need to work under confidentiality constraints. So some of these groups, especially those based in government, do not make their uh, outputs publicly available. Uh, you'll see in the case of the forum, they're in the public domain except when they're done for political parties in the lead up to an election because the confidentiality concerns are even more pronounced then. All of these platforms, not surprisingly, because they're part of a VIPnet, use these rapid syntheses as one of many strategies to support the use of evidence. Uh, and in terms of evaluations, our most robust evaluations come from Reach Policy Uganda. So Rona uh, Majumbe Deve has produced a number of reports. Uh, and for those of you who can speak Spanish, there's now a handbook available from a VIPnet Chile about how they approach this. So in conclusion, fantastic guide on rapid reviews, really critical addition. 
I would love one day to see similarly great guides on other types of rapid evidence products, and we can build on the work uh, by Michelle Happy, who's uh, on the webinar as well, uh, among others in doing that. If you want information on any of these platforms and how they approach their work, uh, here's the contact information. So that's it for me, and in summary, fantastic guide, great addition to what we have available. Great, thank you so much, John. Thank you, everyone. We will move now to taking questions. If you have any questions, please use the raise your hand option or um, just uh, send us your question on the panel on the right. So, since we still don't have any questions coming our way, um, Andrea, maybe I can go back to showing how um, the results from the polls to see how many of our um, attendees have actually engaged and uh, uh, engaged not users in which uh, step. Yeah, I think that sounds good. So I think um, the results show that 70% uh, um, uh, engaged knowledge users in the conceptualization and design. Um, and then we had 56% in the literature search and study selection, and then fewer in knowledge product development and data collection and synthesis. So um, I think it makes sense that many would have engaged the knowledge user at the beginning because usually for these rapid reviews, they are knowledge user generated. So it would be a query or a question coming from them. So, so I think it would make sense that we would be engaging with them at the very beginning and perhaps a bit lesser so uh, in the knowledge uh, product development. Um, and again, it's nice to show that people have engaged at the various steps and sometimes we can engage them at every single step if, if we do have the luxury of doing that. Okay, that's great, that's great. So, um, so we have our first question and the question is, what do you mean by knowledge product development? How is it different from the synthesis itself? Great, so I agree that might have been a bit of a vague term. I think we were talking about um, more the knowledge translation strategies and um, putting together the end of the review. How would we get the message out? How would we disseminate these results? Um, so I think that that's what we meant by that, but I agree that this the way we worded it was quite vague. So perhaps more people would have selected that if we were a bit clear with the terminology there. Okay, great. Um, so, so Andrea, what about the other poll? So what methods have you or your team used to streamline the review process? So I think the least used one was use uh, one reviewer to perform study selection, which I think is a good indicator. Yeah, no, I think that that's very interesting. And um, I think that people kind of shy away from that because they're worried that we're going to miss something. Um, so, so I think it was interesting that people are limiting the number of databases search and perhaps this could mean that perhaps people are not searching uh, unpublished databases, for example. Uh, the, the Cochrane recommendation is to search at least two databases. So perhaps instead of searching five or six, we would just search two. Um, so, so I think it's quite interesting. Um, we may also limit the search by the date or language, which is quite popular. I think that um, date or language limit limit uh, limitations are also common in systematic reviews. <laughs> so this is where we have the, the continuum of rapid reviews and systematic reviews. Um, so, so I think the, this is quite, these are quite common sense findings and um, we are actually currently conducting a study where we are prospectively comparing rapid reviews and systematic reviews on the same topic and we are actually using the method of only having one reviewer to perform study selection for the rapid reviews. And it's, it's uh, very hard for uh, an experienced team to use this method. <laughs> um, so I think we're just not comfortable with it. So it, it'll be interesting to see what our results show uh, when we use that, that particular method. Okay, that's great. We'll be definitely looking forward to that. 
Thank so you. the next question is, is Policy Brief a concept product only for systematic review or rapid review evidence or research project evidence? I guess I'm using the term in a very particular way. So, so I get. So, let, let me start by saying there's huge amounts of terminology out there. Policy brief to one person could be a uh, a bulleted half-page summary of what was learned from a single study. Um, with a VIPnet, where it's more commonly now called evidence brief for policy rather than policy brief it has a very particular meaning and, and that meaning is that it's a context specific summary of what's known for, from uh, single studies and systematic reviews about a problem about three options for addressing it and about implementation considerations so i think the short answer to your question is policy brief that term means very different things to different people so it could mean any of what you say uh, in the avipnet context it's more commonly called evidence brief and it means something very particular uh, where the unit of the included products is more commonly much more commonly a systematic review than it would be a single study okay okay that would be great um so i think etienne wanted to add something too yeah just uh some uh, precision on the uh on the poll um and the engagement and some of the review steps uh we saw that um, the vast majority of people were um, uh, engaged uh, knowledge users at conceptualization phase. And I wanted to add that this is critical because oftentimes policymakers or health systems managers come uh, to the review team with a very broad policy question or health system question. And that question, uh, although very important in practice, might not necessarily be amenable to a rapid review uh, or to an evidence synthesis. So there's a great need there for uh, for negotiation between the uh, the reviewers and the uh, the end users themselves to make sure that the question is reviewable but also remains policy relevant. Okay, great. Thank you, Etienne, for clarifying that. So our next question is: Beside the short time frame of rapid review, what other advantages do, does it have compared with standard systematic review? All of us could potentially provide some of that. <laughs> um, I mean, from, from my perspective, a rapid reviews come from knowledge users. So they're a really great example of knowledge translation at work, whereas uh, there are many examples of systematic reviews that are actually academic driven. So they are based on, uh, out of curiosity, for example, by researchers. Um, so, so the nice thing about a rapid review is that it would have been commissioned by a knowledge user and it would perhaps be a lot more impactful, it would be more relevant. Um, there's evidence showing of all the research ways, so I'm not sure if anyone has had a chance to read the, um, the, the series in The Lancet on research waste. Um, and so, so rapid reviews are really great because we are working closely with the knowledge users and providing them with evidence to help support their decision making. Okay, great. Thank you, Andrea. So we'll take one last question, which is, has the method for pilot testing of the study screening process been reported or published anywhere so we can follow it? Or is it in the rapid reviews guide? So I, I don't think the, I haven't looked at the Cochrane Handbook lately about pilot testing. Um, so, so I'd have to look that up. Um, usually we report it in every single review that we've done. So we would say these 10 people were involved with pilot testing or calibration and our percent agreement was hopefully more than 75%. If it was lower than that, then we would report the percent agreement and we would say the number of pilot tests that we had to do at level one screening, level two screening and data abstraction. We haven't written a paper on it or an empirical study on it. Um, but we usually report it in individual uh, papers. Um, so, so whoever, I don't know who sent this question, but fe please feel free to contact me. Um, I think tomorrow you will be sending out our contact information. Yes, definitely. 
Yeah, so feel free to contact me and I'm happy to share a paper where we kind of outline the process for that and, and answer any questions on how to do that. Great, thank you, Andrea. Um, John, did you want to add something? Yeah, it was just that in response to that last question, I, I can't remember if it was Etienne or Andrea who had a very helpful slide with the three advantages of rapid reviews. So timeliness, which the questioner identified, um, relevance, which Andrea spoke to, and then the third one, uh, which is efficiency. So, um, you know, these can often be uh, produced with fewer people uh, with smaller budgets and so on. So I thought their list of of the three advantages, timeliness, relevance, and efficiency, were all very helpful, and it's it's important to think about the three of them together. Great, thank you, John. So thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Andrea, Etienne, John, for the great webinar. Thank you, Dario, for your help, and thank you for everyone who has uh, participated in our webinar today. We will be uh, sharing the link for the recording once it's available, along with these slides. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.